Hello. <laughs> Welcome to Archival Adventures. I'm hoping you can see my hat. Uh, <laughs> as you can see, we've had a slight change in the setup, uh, which honestly, we've been waiting for this change for a while. I have a green screen again, uh, but in all of the previews, it was green screening out my shirt and my hat, even though they're not the color of the background. But it looks like what's actually going out to you all um, is working properly. So that's good. <laughs> um, I don't know why the preview was insisting that my hat was going to completely disappear, but uh, I'm, I'm happy to see that that is not the case. Um, so uh, yeah, welcome. Um, we actually had, uh, they were in yesterday and, in, and installed the green screen. Um, they also installed, there's like a, I don't know what it's called, a truss of some sort up there that we'll be able to put um, actual hung cameras on so that um, I'll be able to do some of the larger materials and have like a full on uh, top down camera that I can control via remote control in order to uh, show you the larger pieces. Uh, if you were here a couple weeks ago, you may remember the Ladies Home Journal and how working with uh, the document camera um, really didn't work so great for those larger pages. Uh, and so we are getting technology finally that is um, gonna enable doing some of those more, uh, uh, more difficult pieces, the larger pieces. Uh, so that is, is happening. Headphone band is clipping a little bit. Eh, whatever. Uh, <laughs> Hi, JNCNO. Welcome. It is good to see you. Um, and let me say hello to the people over on the other channel. Uh, if you're new here, um, I am live on two, <laughs> two Twitch channels. I've got uh, the uh, twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios, which is the Virginia Tech University Libraries channel and uh, twitch.tv slash rogan27, which is my personal channel. Uh, and, you know, we've been streaming on both of these channels for about a year now. Uh, the first couple episodes were just on the library's channel, but then I accidentally went live on both one day, and, you know, why not? Let's share the content to as many people as possible. Uh, so let me say uh, hello, Obi-Wan Pez, hello, Key Squared, uh, hello, Fluidan. Um, hi, Hannah. <laughs> yes, we have green screen back. Um, and so uh, I, I will go over what we're going to cover on today's stream very shortly. But before I do, I'm going to start the same way that I always start, <laughs> um, which is uh, reading the um, uh, land and labor acknowledgments uh, from the university. Um, they provide some commitments that the university makes towards the indigenous uh, community specifically, and I think it's important to um, regularly revisit them. So once a week at the top of the show, we read them out. Uh, Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tudelo and Monacan people's homeland, and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that legislation and practices like the Morrill Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of Native nations from their lands, both locally and in Western territories. We understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tudelo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. We must also recognize that enslaved black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and were prohibited from attending until 1953. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to ut prosim, that I may serve, in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. So I do try to make sure that on this program, um, we feature as many materials as we have in the archives that are from historically marginalized communities, in part because uh, my job as community collections archivist here at Virginia Tech um, involves highlighting 
and growing those uh, parts of our collection that deal with historically marginalized communities. Um, that said, the amounts of our collection that actually deal specifically with those communities are very, very small. Uh, and I work to try and increase that, um, but it is, it is very slow going uh, for a multitude of reasons that someday I can talk about if you really want to know. Um, but uh, I do think it's important to pay attention to that. So, um, oh dear. <laughs> oh dear. Yes, yes, Obi. Uh, if I had um, sand colored screen behind me, I would be completely invisible because everything here is very sand colored at the moment. Um, Anyway, uh, so I think we are going to be down at least one of our mods today because um, they are actually leading a large group of eighth graders um, th throughout the library. Uh, part of what they will be doing is uh, taking those eighth graders to an exhibit that's up on the fourth floor here. Um, it's an exhibit that I am the director of the project for, uh, so I should probably mention it. Um, our library is host to the Americans and the Holocaust exhibit from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Um, the touring exhibit uh, was a collaboration between the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and the American Library Association Public Programs Office. Um, and we applied for that back in 2019. Um, and we were one of 50 libraries selected. We're actually the closest one to Washington, D.C. Um, and so we have, this is the second time we've actually received the, sh the, uh, the exhibit. Uh, the first time we received it was back in March of 2020. And we got, it, it arrived at our loading dock. We set it up on the second floor. And then we, the building was closed for like seven months. Uh, so, Needless to say, the tour got delayed, and the tour is now in full force again, uh, and we have received the exhibit here. It's here until the very, very, very beginning of May. Um, so uh, if you happen to be in Southwest Virginia, in the Blacksburg area, near Virginia Tech's campus, and you want to stop by Newman Library and pop in um, up on the fourth floor, uh, that exhibit is a really, really, really good exhibit. If you are not going to be in Southwest Virginia, but you are in the United States um, and you're curious about the exhibit, you can look online if you search for Americans and the Holocaust tour schedule. Um, you can get a listing of all of the 50 libraries that are hosting it. I know um, they include libraries in Alaska and Hawaii, as well as uh, many of the uh, continental 48 states. Uh, the states that don't have host sites are typically right around Washington, D.C., where they're much, much closer to the actual museum, or uh, I believe a couple of states in New England where um, they have access to a lot of material on the Holocaust. Uh, and this exhibit was specifically meant to travel to libraries where um, there wasn't necessarily a lot of information about the Holocaust available. So uh, we do have a number of events coming up related to that. If you're curious about all that, you can visit the library's site and, and get that information. Um, but that is something that I've had going on now for uh, just over two years, and it's it's Good to see it finally here when the library is open and people can come in and see the exhibit and, and attend some of our events. Um, <clears throat> but what we are actually going to be covering on stream today is this one box. It's a, a relatively small box. It is a collection that I processed a few years ago, I don't remember, 2015, 2016 time frame, um, and it is the Blacksburg Community Federation records, um, which might seem extraordinarily local, considering most people have never been to or 
in fact, even heard of Blacksburg, Virginia. But the Blacksburg Community Federation was founded sometime in the 1920s. In fact, let me pull up uh, let me pull up the finding aid and I can give you exact details. Um, do, 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 do. Nope. Uh, see, I would have already had this ready to go, except I was worrying about the green screen instead of doing the rest of my on-computer preparation. Um, let's, let's all go to the lobby. Uh, gonna just drop. There's a link to the finding aid for that channel. Let me get a link to the finding aid for the other channel real quick. Uh, and then we'll talk about what we're gonna look at today and why it's interesting, um, which in this case I actually know uh, because as I said, I processed this one. Uh, most of the time we look at things that I've never seen before and we discover them together. In fact, next week's uh, collection that we're looking at is one of those where I really know nothing about it, uh, but something caught my eye and so I wanted to share it. Um, right, you should all have access to the finding aid via that link. Um, the finding aid is the description of what is in the collection and how it's organized. Uh, Blacksburg Community Federation, uh, founded in 1926. The records that we have go through 1957. Um, and let's see, oh, sorry. Uh, the records we have start in 1926. The Federation itself was founded in 1928. Um, it was formed to unite various community organizations toward common goals related to public health, education, and community beautification. It was originally called the Blacksburg Federated Council and preliminary formation activity began in 1926 and a joint meeting of committees was held in 1927. The full community federation formed in 1928 following presentation of the Blacksburg Community Study compiled by the Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University Department of Rural Sociology and 26 local organizations from around the Blacksburg area. Um, so this organization was founded just before the stock market crash in, at the end of the 1920s, just before the Great Depression, uh, and operated through World War II. Uh, and it was one of many mutual aid organizations to operate throughout the 1930s. Uh, and in fact, if you're familiar at all with mutual aid organizations during that time period, or let's say if you are familiar at all with the board game known as Monopoly, uh, you will have heard of a concept called a community chest. And this organization actually operated a community chest uh, for a number of years, and we have some of their fundraising materials from their community chest campaigns, uh, which is one thing that I think is really interesting about the collection, uh, considering that I didn't really know much about community chest beyond Monopoly before I processed this collection um, and was looking at the materials. Uh, so since it was new to me and interesting to me when I first saw it, I thought it might be interesting to other people. Plus. Basically everything in the archives is interesting for one reason or another, and we typically just pull it out, look at it, and see uh, what we can find that's unique and interesting. Um, that's sort of the modus operandi for the uh, stream. So I think we're gonna get started. Um, and as always, feel free to ask me questions as we go along. Uh, provide your own commentary or um, look up information and let me know details about stuff that you know I may not know because this is a learning experience not just for you but for me. Uh, so <laughs> let's go ahead and uh, queue up folder number one. 
Um, document focus. Switch. Hey, hey, look. I love having the green screen back. Um, <laughs> hopefully, uh, oh, but we're definitely going to lose my hat on this screen for some reason. I don't know. It's fine. Uh, we will adjust as we go. Maybe I'll wear a different hat on Wednesdays now. Instead of the brown one, I will wear something that is a starker contrast from the green. Uh, anywho, folder number one is membership information officers and committees. Probably not going to be the most interesting thing that we find in the collection, but who knows? Let's take a look at it and see. gonna make sure you all can see what we're looking at. All right, first page in here, Blacksburg Community Federation Officers and Committees for 1938. Um, I'm just gonna look real quick and see if there are earlier dates, because I like going chronologically. Like we've got 1951 stuff. Yeah, I don't see. I don't see anything earlier than 1938 for this folder. So let's start here and see what we find. Um. So they had a president, vice president, secretary, treasurer, and none of these names jump out as particularly interesting at the moment. Uh, civic committee. Public Health Committee, Education Committee, Social Service Committee, and Young People's Committee. So those are some interesting committees. I, I The Public Health Committee would be uh, particularly interesting in light of the last couple of years. Uh, Education Committee, not really surprising. Um, looking at this, for, from my perspective, uh, I'm seeing names that I know regionally, like they're common names regionally, like Albert and Handley. Um, so they stick out to me for that reason, but otherwise, with the information I have at hand, and I don't have any specific particular research topics in mind, this one's not the most particularly interesting to me. Uh, I think this is just a second copy. Ah, but here we have um, descriptions of what these committees do, which that is going to be much more interesting, I think. The Blacksburg Community Federation. The Civic Committee is planning one Improvement of a play area on Roanoke Street for older children and a play area between the agricultural building and the main school building for smaller children. Two, landscaping of the high school campus. Uh, these plans were made by Professor A. A. Farnham and have been accepted by the school board. A, a WPA grant is anticipated to supplement findings from the Federation. Um, The high school that they're talking about, uh, I, I believe is the same one. I So I've heard rumors about this high school. Uh, I'm just looking to see if I can quickly confirm anything. Uh, so I, I know that in 2011, uh, part of the high school collapsed. Uh, I've heard rumors as to why, but I can't, I, I don't know the exact reason. 
but sorry, just the fact that they were beautifying the high school. Um, and honestly, like many, many years before the incident, but that's, the high school brought it to mind for me. Anyway, the public health committee has four objectives for the year. One, a clinic will be held in the school for tonsils, eyes, ears, etc. Those needing glasses or operation will be advised of such and arrangements made to help those who cannot afford medical attention. Two, oxygen will be available for emergency cases. Three, it is the intention of the committee to erect recreation facilities to induce our people into the open air and sunshine. Uh, and four, we will cooperate with the state and county public health officials in gathering data and rendering direct aid when possible. So public health wants to get people out and exercising um, and is, is going to make arrangements to make sure people get medical treatment even if they can't afford it. The Education Committee plans four projects for the year. One, to aid in improving the lighting in some, of the, in some of the school rooms. Two, to cooperate in securing library books in high school and elementary school. To cooperate, three, to cooperate with the women's club in securing books so placed as to be available at all times. And four, to give assistance in sponsoring a community day. It's lovely to see a community organization pulled together in order to help the school library get books. Uh, considering that today so many organizations are getting, getting together to um, try and force school libraries to remove books. Um, and indeed a major library vendor at the moment is uh, working on building technology that would notify parents as soon as a school child checks out a book from their school library uh, and would allow parents to specify certain topics that their children are not allowed to check books out uh, regarding. The example given was that any book tagged with LGBTQ, the student would be prohibited from checking out. Um, I have thoughts. Basically, hello library vendor, whose name I'm not saying on stream at the moment. Uh, that goes against like all of the principles of librarianship uh, around privacy and information access. And therefore, you're not going to get support from librarians. And in fact, the discourse I've been seeing is very negative on it. Uh, so I, I hope that that library vendor listens to feedback from librarians and uh, makes an adjustment. But. Um, here, the Education Committee was all for getting more books. I like this. The Social Service Committee will give aid to the children's home and relief to emergency cases until a study has been made of these cases and they have been properly classified and turned over to the proper agency. And the Young People's Committee will aid both organized and unorganized boys and girls of the community by promoting desirable youth activities and organizations. An inventory of present activities and needs will be used as a basis for development. Let's see, what do we have? Membership and plan of operation from 1951. Uh, it's in a folded pamphlet here. October 1st, 1951. The Blacksburg District Community Federation. Yet another iteration of their name, apparently. Objectives. The purposes of the Blacksburg Community Federation, now beginning its 24th year, are to promote cooperation between forward-looking individuals, volunteer organizations, and public agencies for the development and general well-being of the community to provide a means of mutual assistance for undertakings which single organizations cannot accomplish alone, to lessen duplication of effort. <laughs> Not to mention it wouldn't even work. Uh, yes, they can read books in the library. So just because the student want, like, and, and in, uh, Jay and C, you know, uh, in many cases, 
if a student is interested in a book on LGBTQ, they're not going to want to check it out anyway. They're going to surreptitiously look at it while it's on the shelf. Uh, because they don't want anyone to know they're interested in the topic because of so much social stigma around it. So, so yeah, absolutely, they, um, it, it. Technological means to spy on children, uh, or to give parents the uh, means to spy on children at their school library, um, are not good. Um, public libraries have material available, school libraries have material available. The librarians in most cases want to make sure that students can access that material because it's good psychologically for students to have access to information that helps them to understand their body and the changes it's going through when they're going through puberty. And that includes sexual awakening and topics related to it. So more information is better. Um, and at the same time, if you go to the elementary level and you're talking about like, uh, I, I'm not gonna get the title wrong, but like Jimmy Has Two Mommies or something like that. Um, those books help students to understand the world as it actually is. And if you hide that from them, then they have trouble adjusting later in life. So most librarians are all for information access. And I do understand parents say, wanting to prevent students from, accessing things at school when they're consistently told by librarians uh, that it is not the library's job to uh, to monitor what children are accessing. It is the parents job to monitor their children when they are accessing material at the library. And that goes 100% for public libraries. I do understand that school libraries, um, they're is less opportunity for parents to be there and monitor what their child is accessing. But at the same time, school libraries provide educational material. Um, and most librarians are going to fight to keep that there. Anyway. <laughs> Note. Oh, was there an extra slash? I am so, so sorry, T squared. Thank you for making that note. Yeah, I do see it there. Um, I don't know how that happened. I'm just gonna like copy and paste that link one more time so that you have a clean link. Uh, hello, Galara Dragon. Thank you so much for the resubscription for four months. It's good to see you. And, and this is not a stream about libraries and privacy, but I, as a librarian who has been a professional archivist slash librarian for six years, um, Definitely do not support a library vendor adding capabilities to their product, allowing parents to specify that their child is not allowed to check out uh, books on certain topics, or um, automating an email to the parents anytime their child checks a book out, telling them what the book is and what the subjects are that are related to that book. No, I'm not in favor of this, especially as a uh, openly gay man who discovered uh, the concept of gay in part through looking at books at my library when I was 13. Um, and literally had no idea what it was and began to understand myself much better after having access to that information. So, anywho. Uh, let's see, there's a preamble to the Federation Constitution here. And this is not the Federation of Star Trek. This is the Blacksburg Community Federation. Um, progress is not automatic in the sense that if we were all to be cast into a deep slumber for the space of a generation, we should awake to find ourselves in a greatly improved social state. The world only grows better, even in the moderate degree in which it grows better because people wish that it should and take the right steps to make it better. Apparently, John Morley said these words. I'm not sure I understand his point. Progress is not automatic in the sense that if we were all put to sleep for the space of a generation, we would awake and find ourselves in a gr Okay, so it's not automatic, meaning that if everyone on the world 
were put to sleep for the time period of a generation, we wouldn't wake up and find a greatly improved world. Got it. The world only grows better even in the moderate degree in which it grows better because people wish that it should and take the right steps to make it better. So it requires people to act in order to make it better. I'm understanding the point. Oh, Galara, oh geez, yes, that, um, preventing a student from checking out a book because they think it will be above the student's reading level uh, is also just ridiculous. Let the student check out the book. If it's above their reading level, they'll either rise to it or they won't enjoy it and they'll return it. But it's not up to the library to decide that something is too high a level for somebody. That's how you make gifted students bored and disengaged. Uh, if you've got a gifted student who has an understanding high above their level, let them have access to the material at the level that they're at. Anywho, you were really upset. Your brother and you have always read two to six years ahead. Yeah. And I, I typically read behind my level. I was so bored when I was reading when I was really little. Um, but about the time I hit 13, I suddenly was reading on my level, and then by the time I had finished high school, I was ahead of my level. Ahead of my level, whatever level is. But um, it, it took me finding material I engaged with in order to uh, make me read to my potential. Uh, when I was in elementary school, I wasn't engaging with the material, and so I was really slow at, at reading. Um, what's the worst that, that could happen? They learn new vocabulary words. They learn concepts that are considered too adult for their age group, I think is what people are worried about. Uh, but the thing is, if, if parents are engaged with their kids while they are reading, uh, if parents are going with them to the library and helping them pick out books and things like that, um, they have the opportunity to explain some of those concepts in uh, whatever way that they think would be appropriate. And also then, you know, they can feel like they have control over what their children are accessing. But at some point, their children are not going to be directly supervised by them and are going to be exposed to the ideas that parents are trying to keep from them. Uh, and if they are having to hide it, then those parents are never going to have an opportunity to try and contextualize that in the way that they want. Uh, so, anywho. <laughs> Let's see. Supporting organizations. Hi, Crafty Becky. Organizations supporting or which have, in various ways aided the program of the Federation include American Association of University Women, American Legion, American Legion Auxiliary, Arboretum Garden Club, Baptist Church Groups, Blacksburg Road Home Demonstration Club. Got it. Blacksburg Road Home Demonstration Club, which is uh, would have been a group that went around to people's houses to demonstrate products to them, such as like if you think of uh, depictions of like vacuum cleaner salesmen in like the 50s, um, that would have been the type of thing that uh, that club would have done. Blacksburg District Schools, Blacksburg Women's Club, Blacksburg PTA, Chamber of Commerce, Christ Episcopal Church, Christian Church, Daughters of American Revolution, which is a big thing in Virginia, let me tell you. Uh, grade School Mothers, Ingalls chapter, I don't know what Ingalls chapter is, but possibly related to Laura Ingalls Wilder because there are definite connections with that family here. In fact, I think we have at least one collection relating directly to the Ingalls family. Uh, Junior Women's Club, Kiwanis, Lions, Long Shop Home Demonstration Club, Lutheran Memorial Sunday School, Ministerial Association, Music Club, Presbyterian Church Groups, Prices Fork, Grange, Prices Fork Home Demonstration Club, Prices Fork 
Methodist Ladies Aid, Price's Fork PTA. Price's Fork uh, is a regional geographic uh, feature in the area um, that honestly means nothing to anybody today. Today it's just the name of a road, but it is a, a uh, geographic uh, feature in the area. Rotary, Southside Garden Club, Town Council, United Daughters of the Confederacy, which is also a big thing in Southern Virginia, let me tell you. Uh, the Juanetta Tribe, that's a new one on me. I'm not familiar with them, I'm gonna have to look them up. Wisner Memorial, ME Church Groups, and Women's Christian Temperance Union. Oh dear, the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Uh, I don't know. Like, a, a search does not really come up. Oh, maybe here? Juanetta was the name of a chief in a Sioux tribe, but not like associated with this area. I have no idea what this organization is. Because the, the closest I can get is Juanetta was a chief of the Yonktonai, a tribe of the Dakota Sioux. Um, and that is like the only result. Huh. That would be a, an interesting history quest, question if people uh, wanted to... I Like it's Juanetta Tribe number 113 ROM, which makes it sound like it is a subgroup of a larger organization. Um, unfortunately, I do not know what that is. I don't know what R-O-M is. Um, let's see. Uh, it's it's going to be a really hard internet search. Uh, yes, this is what I want. Nope. 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 Yeah. Uh, I don't have enough information, uh, let's see. Ah. So I tried ROM with the periods, uh, 1950s, uh, because I don't want results on ROM, read-only memory. Um, but that didn't really get me anything, it just got me 1950s rom-coms. Um, so I tried adding social organization because it's got to be a social organization like the Lions or Kiwanis, um, but nothing's coming up and I just don't, I, I, I don't know what it is. Yeah, it's probably not read-only memory. Hi, Orangitis! <laughs> Same thing is true for finding math history documents. A lot of documents either were destroyed in Alexandria or throughout history, or just have been lost uh, concerning many contributing... So yes, yes, that's true, Obi-Wan. And um, I do see, we, we have a raid. <laughs> There's a raid from 16-Bit uh, Eric. Welcome in, Whimsies. Um, I I'm gonna switch to my face again real quick to, to say hello. Um, hi, <laughs> welcome, uh, welcome, Whimsies, to... Um, my archives stream, my Wednesday archives stream. Um, if you are new here, if you haven't been here before for the archives stream, uh, I'm Rogan27, who, uh, the channel that you're on. I'm also um, Anthony Wright Day Hernandez, the Community Collections Archivist at Virginia Tech. Um, and I stream both to Virginia Tech's Twitch channel, or sorry, the Virginia Tech University Library's Twitch channel, and to my channel every Wednesday to share materials from our special collections and university archives. Um, 
And what we're looking at today are materials from the Blacksburg Community Federation, which was a mutual aid organization from the 1920s through the 1950s. Uh, so prime time for mutual aid organizations during the Great Depression. Um, we're going to look at some community chest documents and things like that. Uh, and so that's what we have planned for today. And I'd love it if you stuck around. Um, feel free to comment on anything, ask questions about archiving, ask questions about you know, anything you want. If it's inappropriate for this show, then I will not answer it. You know, that's how it goes. But, uh, but yeah, welcome everybody. It is great to have you here. We were just looking at a document. Oh, let me say hello to the people that joined. Geek Outs, hi, Bree. Uh, welcome, Bree. Um, and of course, welcome, Eric. Thank you so much for the raid. Uh, it, I, let me, ah. Uh, I need to do a little shout out. Nope, um, I don't know my own commands, sorry. Uh, there, if you uh, do not already follow 16-Bit Eric, definitely give a follow. Um, I know on uh, the library's channel, we have previously aired um, some TTRPG content. I was game master for some of it. I was a player for some of it. Uh, and if you're at all interested in that type of content, 16-Bit Eric is a wonderful channel to follow. Uh, you get lots of in-depth uh, discussion about so many different RPG systems. Um, so definitely give a follow to him. Uh, J and C and O, also for your in... Oh, <laughs> hi, Jacob. <laughs> well, I am glad uh, that you stopped by. It is nice to meet you as well. Um, I saw a comment about what we were looking at. So uh, we were just looking at a document um, here uh, of supporting organizations. This is an item from 1951. And on the list at near the bottom is this Juanetta tribe, number 113 ROM. And we were just speculating about what that is because uh, it's not like um, an indigenous tribe that I'm familiar with in the area. And it looks to me like it's probably a chapter of a larger organization like the, um, the Lions Club or the Kiwanis Club, although not specifically those, but that type of organization. Um, and so we were just speculating on what that is. Uh, report on multiculturalism is an interesting idea, Obi-Wan. I just don't think that that is a topic that would have been, or, or an organization that would have been um, really operating in the area in 1951. Uh, so my guess would be probably not. That, Galara, um, that is actually a possibility. Um, so a quick disclaimer, as we look at historic documents on this channel, we sometimes encounter language that is not in modern usage uh, and that would be considered derogatory. So the suggestion from um, Galara Dragon, uh, and in fact, responding to Fluidan, um, Fluidan found a reference to a Juanetta tribe number 75, Order of Red Man, nonprofit from Ohio. Uh, and, and sorry, Galara was commenting um, in response, noting that that actually sounds really promising. The Red Man Order sounds plausible, especially with the extremely dated use of uh, that terminology to describe indigenous peoples. So thank you uh, for your wonderful search skills, Fluidan. That, that very much seems like it is probably what this is. This is probably the Waneta tribe number 113 of the Red Man Order. Um, oh, it would have to be Red Order Man, which wouldn't exactly work. So, okay, great. Yes, thank you, of course, for blowing apart what I thought was a great theory. This is how we do research. Uh, we find something promising, examine it, and falsify it. And 
That's how, honestly, all research is done. Research is a series of hypotheses that, have, that we then try to prove they are false. Because you cannot prove anything is true, you can only prove something is false. Um, and so, <laughs> this, is, this is how science is done. Um, <laughs> get a theory, examine it. If you can't prove it's false, for now, it's the dominant theory until you can prove that it's false. Uh, <laughs> yeah, multiculturalism was not uh, in the 1950, like 1951, sadly. <laughs> anyway, it, it was just something that stuck out to me and you know, we're free to examine further. Uh, let's see, a membership and plan of operation. I'm not gonna spend too much more time on these, because these are honestly the least interesting things in here, but we already found, um, we already found something to, to completely get enveloped in and try to investigate, um, which is why I find looking at this stuff so fascinating, uh, because literally, no matter what it is we look at, uh, we find something interesting. That said, there are collections that we have that I will not share on stream. Uh, one of the first collections that I processed when I got here was, um, it was a recruitment mailer from the American Nazi party. And while it is incredibly fascinating and was incredibly difficult to process, it took me days because of the, I had to look at all of it and be able to describe it as impartially as possible. I mean, I didn't have to not be critical of, but I had to be able to describe it uh, in an informational way, which required looking at it, which was very difficult. Um, that is a collection I will never share on stream. for oh so many reasons. <laughs> but we have it for researchers who are interested in doing that research because uh, it's relevant to people who study uh, fascism, white supremacy, and other topics. And therefore, having first-hand material like that available is very valuable from a research perspective, and we are a research institution. Uh, but yeah, it was really hard processing that one. <laughs> List of or organizations made you wonder, have I ever done a program on the Grange movement? I have not, um, and I don't know much about it, so it's not something I've looked to see if we have anything about. Um, I will make a note. Because I, I, I will make that a note uh, for a possible future program. I have to look and see if we have material on it. Um, and if we do, I'm happy to do a program on it. I just, I am not really familiar with it, and so I don't know if we have anything in our archives. Um. Uh-huh, Obi-Wan, you are correct. Yes, so um, in archival work specifically, but also in many other types of work, there is a concept that has been um, written about academically since, uh, I, I don't know exactly when it started being written about academically. The, um, I do know that here at Virginia Tech, we had an archivist who wrote extensively on the topic after 2007, uh, which is when the shooting happened here. Um, the topic that I'm speaking of is called um, Referred Trauma. 
so it's specifically looking at uh, people who are working with historical material who were not present for traumatic events, but they're working with that material for, as an archivist or as a historian or, um, and, and really going in depth with a lot of this material uh, can have trauma effects themselves. And so some of the really violent um, white supremacist type propaganda and things like that can also ha lead to referred trauma. Um, here we have a very, very large collection of um, uh, condolence items from 2007. Um, and working with those brings up all of the stuff around the shooting that happened in 2007. And especially for people who were here in 2007, there's a lot of referred trauma from that or a lot of revisited trauma. Um, from working with those materials. And we may, um, I thought I was gonna share some of that material last year and I didn't. And I'm not sure I'm going to this year. I'm not sure I ever will share anything from the April 16th collection on the stream. Just because it is really difficult, even though none of it directly depicts the events of the day or anything like that. I, I really need to take time and really plan that episode if I'm ever going to do it. Um, I do think it's interesting material and worth looking at. It's just a really delicate topic. And I know that we have some alumni um, that join and watch the stream occasionally and for them especially, um, not knowing what year they graduated or their feelings on uh, the events in 2007, um, it would be a, a really difficult thing to just put out into the world. Uh, so, yeah. You had a Grange Hall back in New Hampshire. It was secondary church when the other one was being serviced. Yeah, so I'm going to have to look into the Grange movement because it's just completely unfamiliar to me. Um, and honestly, the way that I research things <laughs> And this is just the way that I engage with them. Um, I either need a nonfiction book that's written like a fiction book, or I find a novel about, or, or that incorporates a topic. And from that, I get a little primer on a topic, because usually, if you've got a good novelist, they've done research on a topic, and, and if it's a major element of their book, um, I can at least get introduced to it that way, and then I, I if I am interested enough in it, then I do actual like research. But I learn so many things from novels. Anyway, uh, let's look at the collection. <laughs> um, Blacksburg Community Study from the uh, Virginia, Tal Virginia Polytechnic Institute, Department of Rural Sociology and Local Organizations Cooperating, uh, which is not the name of the department. It's the VPI Department of Rural Sociology and local organizations cooperating. Uh, this is a preliminary progress report from February 1st, 1928. 1928 was the year that the Blacksburg Community Federation was founded. Aims and possible value of study, local and statewide. Uh, local to furnish a scientific basis for well-rounded community development and progress to stimulate well-planned, coordinated effort for the most satisfying community life. And statewide to serve as a case study in statewide investigations of A, factors and forces influencing community life and progress, B, services of several types of organizations to their communities, and C, village and country relationships, and to further the movement for planned community development and group cooperation through the observations and contacts of prospective county and home agents, teachers, etc., while VPI students. Let's see. I want, I, I don't so much want to know what they planned to do. I, uh, I, I want to know what they found. That's, that's my thing that I am most interested in from this community study. But we do have an interesting map. We might look at that. Uh, 
The Grange Movement was something your parents were involved in when you were a kid. Big part of life in a lot of rural areas of the U.S. So there's a good chance we might have had one here and may have material. Because um, while I wouldn't necessarily classify Blacksburg and surrounding area as rural today, although uh, some people would still classify them as rural today, I would say the feel in this area is more suburban. Um, for a lot of its existence, this area was very much a rural area. And when you get outside of the Blacksburg, Christiansburg, Radford, like, uh, extended settlement area, uh, if you get just a, a mile or two out, it is very rural still. It's just when you're in Blacksburg, Christiansburg, or Radford, it feels very much like a modern suburban area in the U U.S., which is different. Um, a lot of rural areas, but you don't think you've really given it any thought since you were 10 years old and definitely not since moving into Grange Hall listing there made you think of it. Yeah, yeah, Key Squared. No, I think it's an interesting topic. It's just not something that I'm familiar with and I don't know if we have material. But I'm always looking for new things for programs, so I'm definitely going to look and see if we have material so that we can look at it together if we do. <laughs> Um, so this map is a very interesting map. Social anatomy of the Blacksburg community, high school and trade area. My undergrad degree is in, so, is in a, a subset of sociology called community studies. I have never thought in terms of social anatomy. I don't know what they mean by anatomy. What they're identifying on this map are neighborhoods. I don't know why they refer to that as social anatomy. But okay. You think Blacksburg has too many coffee shops now to really count as rural? Uh, we have less coffee shops now than we did two years ago, but uh, the history of ag extension and so forth goes, yes. Um, and we do still have, um, we still have the barns uh, that are, I mean, you can drive across Blacksburg in 15 minutes, unless there's a football game. Uh, but it, normal, normal traffic when it's not like, between 4.30 and 5.30 in the e evening, or <clears throat> like 7.30 and 8.30 in the morning, uh, and it's not a game day, you can drive from farmland, across town to farmland in about 15 minutes. So it, I think it's technically still rural, but it doesn't feel rural when you're in parts of town. <laughs> Physical structure of the body of the community? I, that's a good guess, Obi-Wan. Well, we're gonna look at them, key squared. So, uh, communities are organisms-ish. That It is true, and I'm interested in the neighborhood. So if you look at a modern map, you can also get definition of the different neighborhoods, and each neighborhood tends to have its own history, especially when you look at metropolitan areas. When I was doing my community studies degree, I was in Minneapolis, and I, uh, did an entire in-depth study on the history of the Seward neighborhood there. Um, and so studying individual neighborhoods can get uh, really interesting because you get different immigrant, immigrant groups or in Blacksburg there was uh, an area where the black population lived, which unsurprisingly was raised to the ground and uh, given over to businesses, um, which was not, not uncommon in the United States. Anyway, let's look. We have the Grisso neighborhood, which is number one, uh, which is out here basically on Brush Mountain. McDonald's Mill, North Fork, Dry Run, Mount Tabor, Luster's Gate, which tells me a little bit about where this is. This is all really rural still today, this area here. Um, you can actually exit out sort of the eastern side of Blacksburg 
possibly northeastern side of Blacksburg, um, and take a bunch of windy mountain roads out under the train tracks uh, and around and get to Interstate 81 uh, in about 20, 25 minutes going that way. Um, but it's still really rural today. Um, Ellet. So yeah, all of this is, is very rural still today, all of those neighborhoods. Uh, Merrimack Mines, I'm not really familiar with. Nine is Glade. Ten is Dowdy Town. I'm very curious about that name. Eleven, we've got Price's Fork, um, which Price's Fork today is considered part of Christiansburg. Uh, so Blacksburg is here. This would have been part of Christiansburg. Uh, uh, today it is. Um, and honestly, the Price's Fork area, um, or rather, it might be a little bit further on from Price's Fork. Wait, no, Price's Fork is not. There are two names that are very similar, and I think I'm getting them confused. I think Price's Fork is Blacksburg, not Christiansburg. Um, 12 is Tom's Creek, 13 is Sunnyside, 14 is Norris Run, 15 is Long's Shop, 16 is Centennial, 17 is McCoy. I've been to the fire department in McCoy to talk to them about uh, sharing, well, uh, to talk to a, a coal mining group about sharing their community records with us. Um, other than that, I know very little about McCoy, but McCoy is definitely not part of Blacksburg today, or considered part of Blacksburg. Uh, 18 is called Poverty Hollow. And 19, where is 19? 19 is over here, right next to the railroad tracks, and it is indeed uh, key squared. Uh, it is Perfater, P-E-R-F-A-T-E-R. Um, and so all of these are basically like their own towns today. Um, what I find interesting is we have number 19 here, but then Blacksburg is listed as number 25 and there's no 20 through 24. Um, and indeed I was, I was correct in that I was mistaken. Uh, Price's Fork. Price's Fork is, uh, over near where the barns are. Uh, for campus. Price's Fork is, is very much in Blacksburg. Um, and it is, I forget what name I'm getting it confused with now, uh, that is over in Christiansburg instead. But it, regardless, that's beside the point. Um, all of these areas are basically their own places now. Like, uh, some of them may have combined, but Luster's Gate, uh, Ellet, except that today it's New Ellet. Um, McCoy, like these are not part of Blacksburg today. They are separate. And in Virginia, it gets really confusing because we are a commonwealth. And so we don't really have like incorporated towns that have defined borders. Uh, and typically what gets considered a town or a township or a city in Virginia uh, depends on whether the United States Postal Service has put in a post office and given them their own zip code. Um, there are a couple, uh, like a dozen or so, actual incorporated cities in Virginia. Um, and I think Christiansburg might be one of them, but Blacksburg is not. Uh, I don't believe. Um, Ellet is not, McCoy is not, even though we talk about them as individual separate townships of their own, and they may even have like a local town council to, to sort of oversee things, although that would be an unofficial committee um, in those cases, uh, which the governmental structure is weird too. Like all of those places would be governed by the county government rather than a local government, um, which in that case, Blacksburg has a town council. So Blacksburg and Christiansburg would both be 
their own political organization things. Uh, yeah, Virginia's county town system is weird. You had to work with some census data to see if you could get small towns, grants for civil... Yeah, it is, and I grew up in it, and it's confusing. So I grew up in Prince William County, uh, which is um, just south of Washington, D.C. Um, uh, Fairfax County is between Prince William and, and D.C. Um, I grew up in Dale City, uh, and today, if you look at a map, you're going to see Dale City. Uh, it's going to be one of the larger places that's called out on a map. Dale City is not a city. It is not an incorporated city in its own right. It does not have, it does not, as, as I am aware, it does not have its own post office. Uh, when I was growing up, our mail went through the Woodbridge post office, but we had our own zip code. Uh, and had at one time a Dale City post office, but then the Dale City post office closed and it was all Woodbridge again as far as the Postal Service was concerned. Uh, but Dale City is large population-wise and therefore ends up showing up on maps. Um, and I went from growing up in Prince William County and the only actual like, city in cities in Prince William County are Manassas and Manassas Park. Um, and the rest of it is just governed at the county level. Uh, I went from there and I went to college in Winchester, Virginia, which was its own town and is in Frederick County, Virginia, but had an actual like city government for the city of Winchester and then the county government for the county of Frederick County. Um, and so the Commonwealth system and cities and towns and what is and is not a town in Virginia is rather fungible and uh, confusing. But basically, everything is county-level government unless it's an incorporated city, and there are only about 13 of those. So, or at least, unless they've added more, I don't think they have. Um, when I was in high school, there were only about 13 incorporated cities in Virginia. Anywho, <laughs> we're, we're glancing at things. I thought that was an interesting map. I'm very confused about social anatomy. I do want to look at the community chess stuff, though. And I, I, I see our time bleeding away. We've had some interesting conversations today, and I've been very distractible. And I don't mind being distracted by questions from chat. I enjoy the questions from chat. But I do want to share the community chess stuff, because I think it is absolutely fascinating. So I'm going to skip a few folders. Uh, and we're going to look at fundraising materials for this organization. <clears throat> And if anybody wants to find, or, or feels compelled to find a good, succinct explanation of the Virginia governmental system of the, the counties versus towns and things like that, um, I can always read it. Uh, actually, aha! Of course, Wikipedia has a short little thing that I can um, read and hopefully provide the clarity that my rambling did not. The administrative divisions of Virginia are the areas into which the Commonwealth of Virginia, a US state, is divided for political and administrative purposes. There are some local governments, others are not. However, all local governments, counties, independent cities, and incorporated towns are political subdivisions of the state. Um, Virginia has 95 counties covering all of the territory not within the independent cities. Under Virginia law, counties may be chartered, although most are not. The populations vary widely. Since Virginia has no civil townships and since incorporated towns cover such a small area of the state, the county is the de facto local government for much of the state. From rural areas to densely populated, unincorporated communities, such as Tyson's Corner is the example they give, uh, in fact, Arlington County, while geographically small and entirely urbanized, is completely unincorporated, making the county board the sole governing body in the entire county. Uh, there are 38 
independent cities in Virginia. Uh, those being Alexandria, Bristol, Buena Vista, Charlottesville, Chesapeake, Colonial Heights, Covington, Danville, Emporia, Fairfax, Falls Church, Franklin, Fredericksburg, Galax, uh, Hampton, Harrisonburg, Hopewell, Lexington, Lynchburg, Manassas, Manassas Park, Martinsville, Newport News, Norfolk, Norton, Petersburg, Pequoson, Portsmouth, Radford, Richmond, Roanoke, Salem, Staunton, Suffolk, Virginia Beach, Waynesboro, Williamsburg, and Winchester, which means uh, Blacksburg and Christiansburg are not independent cities. Virginia's independent cities were classified by the Virginia General Assembly in 1871 as cities of the first class and cities of the second class. First class cities are those having a population of 10,000 or more. Second class cities are those that had a population of 10,000 or of fewer than 10,000. Towns, unlike Virginia cities and like municipalities in other states, incorporated towns are municipalities that are within counties. Local government is thus divided between the town and the county. A town can be formed from any area with a defined boundary having a population of 1,000 or more. The method for forming towns is the same as for cities petitioning the state legislature to grant a charter. As of 2014, there were 191 incorporated towns in Virginia. So Blacksburg and Christiansburg would be incorporated towns, uh, whereas there are only 38 cities in Virginia and everything else is governed at the county level. Thank you, Wikipedia, for helping me to remember my uh, Virginia government classes from high school that were more than 20 years ago and that I have not really had to think about except when I grumble about having to pay taxes to the town of Christiansburg every year on my car because I can't pay them online. <laughs> anywho! I don't know why today is an anywho day, but it is. Um, anywho will do. Any Doctor Who will do. Um, right. We're going to look at these fundraising things. Uh, let's see what years we got. Looks like we have 1934 as the first one here. Dear Citizen, November 14th, 1934 from the Blacksburg Community Federation Community Chest. Community Chest. This is literally that thing that gave you potential benefits in Monopoly. Um, Monopoly. The game that was designed to hate people, to, the, bleh, the game that was literally designed to make people hate capitalism that is celebrated as a model of, uh, 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 yeah, that is celebrated for making people like capitalism? I don't know. It was literally designed to make people hate capitalism. I don't know why it's the most popular board game. Um... Dear Citizen, the Blacksburg Community Federation is again asking for your support. On Friday, November 16th, we are seeking to raise a community chest to carry on your work, to meet what needs we can in necessary and worthwhile undertakings, to relieve distress and advance valuable causes in Blacksburg. The year 1934 has failed to realize the worst fears of the pessimists, but it has failed to fulfill the high hopes of the optimists with reference to our economic conditions. So this would have been in the middle of the Great Depression. People generally seem a little more hopeful than a year ago, but despite our generous share of PWA building, there are still hard times ahead. The Federal Emergency Relief Administration is still at work to help out as it has had to do on a nationwide scale because private relief had broken down in so many states. This is, however, an emergency undertaking, and the administration, as President Roosevelt has said, still maintains that care for the needy is primarily a community responsibility. It insists that localities do their full share, and there is even now a threat that funds will be withdrawn from Virginia if the state does not contribute its quota. We in Blacksburg must not fail in discharging our neighborly obligation 
to help those about us who need our help. There are many to whom the government relief funds cannot go. Such cases we hope to help directly not duplicating, but supplementing the FIRA where necessary. Uh, FIRA being the Federal Emergency Relief Administration. <clears throat> then there are many good causes which we can advance by cooperating as in no other way in health matters, in assisting the schools, in supporting character building agencies. There is no effective substitute for the community chest. Roanoke abandoned its community chest this year and there are possibly 12 independent drives underway now to raise funds. All are failing far short of their goals and the separate agencies are reporting are reported to feel that they would have been far better off to have continued in the chest and taken whatever their fa uh, whatever their share may might have been. We are convinced that we are much better off to continue our community chest. The budget for the coming year totals the same as that which we presented a year ago, $1,600. This total is allocated to the following causes. For the Social Service Committee, $500. The work of this committee is still vitally necessary, as came out in a conference with the FIRA Administrator for Montgomery County. We were able last April to assist in preserving life and health at Merrimack Mines when the mines were closed and the Civil Works Administration had ceased work and the Federal Emergency Relief Administration was not yet set up. Such emergencies are unpredictable and our community was most fortunate in having the means at hand to give aid. The present government relief is available only where there is an employable member of the family. Other families do not qualify. The present minimum of $12 a month is wholly inadequate in case of sickness or accident. No self-respecting community should be without provision to help, where, to help where help is desperately needed. There are other activities, notably the arrangement of special remembrances at Christmas in the form of baskets for needy families. For the Education Committee, $225. We have a new high school building in process of erection. There will inevitably be some needs which we will want to assist in meeting when the building is completed. We want to help with special books and with playground equipment. We also want to continue Rural School Day, a magnificent program stimulating interest and neighborliness among our surrounding schools, which has been splendidly managed by Mr. A. T. Lewer. For the Public Health Committee, $200. Clinics for school children to examine and treat teeth and eyes are invaluable in building healthy citizens. Epidemic control, orthopedic clinics, and working for better health conditions generally are aims well sought for throughout, through this committee. For Religious Life Committee, $100. This committee sponsors and supports a Teacher's Training Institute. It also looks forward this year to exploring possibilities for weekday religious education and assisting in providing leadership for rural Sunday schools. For the Civic Community, $50. This will be used in part in improving the cemetery. It will also provide for expenses which might be necessary in seeking to have work commenced on the new post office building and for entering into any civic enterprise for the beautification and betterment of the community. For the Children's Home Society, $175. This society has always cared for more children from our district than contributions from Blacksburg have paid for and deserves more than this amount. I'm guessing the Children's Home Society must be like an orphanage, but I'm not certain. If anyone wants to look it up and let me know, uh, that'd be great. For the FLY Club, Boy and Girl Scouts, $50 each. These organizations, open to all boys and girls, do more than is easy to estimate in building good citizens of the future. Students aided by FIRA funds make provisions for paying FLY club workers unnecessary now, but all need... What? Students aided by FIRA funds make provision for paying FLY club workers... For paying FLY club workers unnecessary now, but all need equipment and badges for recognition of meritorious work.
Expenses at camp are provided for a few deserving members. I don't know why that sentence was a stumble for me, but it was. For administration, including the cost of the test drive, $50. So right up front, they're saying, hey, you know, we're gathering money for all these community needs. And one of the line items is administration, including running this drive. Here's how much of the money we're gathering goes to that. For emergencies and possible shrinkage in pledges, $150. Uh, so that would be, they're looking to raise $150, and part of that $150 would go to cover shrinkage in pledges, which is people who pledged money but didn't actually give the money. As there may be those who feel that they would that they want to support some, but not all of these activities, anyone who desires to designate the purposes for which his contribution is to go may do so. Otherwise, all gifts will be divided in the proportions indicated above in the budget adopted by the Federation at its October meeting. The solicitors for the community chest will also act as solicitors for the Red Cross and will ask you to enroll as members of that great organization, which has meant in relief administered in Montgomery County about $6,000 more in the last five years than has, than has been sent in from the county to national headquarters. A leaflet concerning the Red Cross is enclosed. Sadly, I don't think we have that leaflet. Um, please consider <clears throat> Will the causes for which your support is asked, oh, I think it means please consider well the causes for which your support is asked and give according to your ability. Your gift and your neighborly response is earnestly requested. Very sincerely yours, R.S. Martin, President, Blacksburg Community Federation. So let's see, a children's home society. I'm going to look it up and see what it is. They still exist. Who are you? What what are you? Uh, uh, about mission and history. The Children's Home Society of Virginia is a full-service private nonprofit, non-sectarian, licensed child placing agency and one of Virginia's oldest adoption agencies. Since our charter by the Virginia General Assembly in 1900, CHS has been guided by the fundamental belief that every child deserves a home. So yeah, essentially like an orphanage um, to care for the children and help them find homes. Although I don't know that they operate uh, as an orphanage today. It says they're an adoption agency today, but back in 1934, uh, <laughs> they probably would have been operating as an orphanage. So that was, that was a community chest letter, uh, fundraising letter. Let's see what else we got. We've got 1936, 1937. 1942, this one's an interesting time period to look at. We can go back and look at some of these older ones if we want to, but 1942, to the solicitors of the Blacksburg Community Chest Fund. Herewith are directories of Blacksburg service agencies. Please give a copy to each person you solicit, whether or not he contributes. Uh, also herewith are copies of the Federation budget and activities. You may give each person a copy of this budget if he desires. It shows what his money will be used for. You may be asked if a contribution can be earmarked for use of a certain committee. The Federation ruled that it could be done. A person may wish to wait until after he receives his pay on November 1st before he contributes. This may be done or he may give a post-dated check. Oh. I worked in a bank for a time. Post-dated checks were not good. But I also worked in a bank in the 21st century. 
And this was the 1940s. Post-dated checks were just a thing in the 1940s. <laughs> They're not so much a thing today. <laughs> um, I'm not even certain. So if I was presenting this to um, some of our students, like if I was presenting this to incoming freshmen, I'm not certain they would know what a post-dated check even is. It's possible they would, but writing checks is sort of out of the cultural context for a lot of younger people in America today. Um, just like many, many freshmen entering college today have never had to read or write cursive to the point where they were not taught cursive. And so occasionally we will have to teach a student employee cursive so that they can work with some of the historic documents that we have. Yeah, Crafty Becky, like I'm, I'm not certain that 100% of the freshmen entering college today would know what a check is. Your bank account came with five checks when you got it in 2011 and you've used exactly that many checks. I, I do know that the number of checks given with a new bank account has gone down. They used to give an, a full book um, of starter checks and ask you to place an order for permanent checks at the time you opened the account. Uh, and when I worked as a bank teller, that was standard practice. If somebody was open, opening an account, they got a book of starter checks, uh, you helped them to place an order for permanent checks, and they got a debit card. By the time I had moved here for my job as an archivist, you got the debit card, and that was it. You didn't get starter checks, and you did not get uh, encouraged to buy a checkbook. They gave you materials so that you could order checks if you wanted to, but checks were not a standard part of the bank account opening process. Uh, you just got the debit card. Yeah, like a thin checkbook. That's, um, that's like the starter checkbook, but, but thinner as years went on. Yeah, I mean, there are still a lot of people that do use checks regularly and, and order decorative checks. And I think you will find, uh, <clears throat> this is pure speculation on my part, but I, it, it, I would not be surprised to find that people in lower economic brackets um, use checks more. Um, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, but yeah, post-dating checks, not, not something that most places will let you do today. The idea of a check card and you were shocked, yeah. <laughs> The only check you've ever written was for your security deposit. You had to order a whole checkbook for that. Yeah, um, there are very few things today that I need checks for. And the few times that I have needed a check over the last, well, I was gonna say over the last two years, but the last two years are uh, not applicable. Uh, over the last four years in that case, uh, the, the few times that I've needed checks, I just went to the bank and got a cashier's check because um, the bank account that I have, there's no fee for the cashier's checks. Uh, so rather than ordering an entire checkbook, I just went and got a cashier's check. But it's, it's literally just for property taxes on my car that get paid to the town I live in. That's the only thing that I can't pay with a credit card. Oh, well, I can. I just have to write my credit card number on a slip and send it via the postal service. So I send a check instead. But 
when you started at a bank, there were a lot of farmers and farmers that used checks to sell and buy livestock. But that was like 30 years ago. Yeah, yeah, I, it, it, they're just, they fell out of fashion because debit cards or check cards became a much more popular and easy means. Like when check cards first came out, and this is an interesting discussion prompted by looking at this document from 1942. Um, when check cards first came out, uh, I was not yet 18. I was working in a toy store. Um, I had my own bank account. I couldn't get a check card. I couldn't get a debit card because it had the Visa logo on it. And therefore, I couldn't have one because they wouldn't issue a card with the Visa or MasterCard logo on it to anyone under 18 because Visa and MasterCard were credit card companies. So even though it was linked to your checking account, they would not issue you a card until you were 18 when they first started those services. <laughs> Post office used to be the bank. Um, used to be the place to be for you because you needed money orders. Yeah. Um, and and it, I, I didn't fully read your comment before I made my, my comment. The post office in many rural communities was the only bank. The post office used to operate as a bank. You could get money orders. You could wire money and things like that. Um, the Western Union uh, as a corporation sort of took over some of the services that the post office used to provide with regard to wiring funds and, and uh, transfers of that sort. Um, but yeah, a lot of, uh, we're talking like pretty far back, like Ameri uh, Old West time frame, uh, where the post office would actually operate as a bank. And there's been talk of uh, adding banking services to the United States Postal Service um, again uh, over the last like decade or so. There's been discussions of maybe the Postal Service should operate uh, and let people open bank accounts and things like that. And there's been pushback against it, mostly from banking lobbies. Um, but there's a lot of sociological evidence that it would be beneficial to poorer communities uh, to be able to do their banking at the post office. Um, and, and there's a lot of politics and a lot of interests that go in and out of that discussion. But um, it is a service that post offices used to offer in in the you know gold rush times and the the United States old west period um, and oh you can still get postal money orders yeah it's been a while since I needed a postal money order but but yeah you're right was not worth it you used to beg your parents to write checks for you so you could buy stuff through the mail Oh, yeah, of course you had to give your allowance back. That's how parenting worked back then. <laughs> Knowing Better did a video on banking. And the post office offering banking services was brought up as a let's think about starting that again. Yeah. And, and so a, a cashier's check from the post office doesn't seem... Uh, yeah, it, it was a money order. But yeah, money orders and cashier's checks are similar. Um, basically, they're guaranteed funds, and once they're endorsed, they're the same as cash. Once they're endorsed by the name, like uh, the name that's written on the front as to who the recipient is, which is why they have a printed recipient, because if they just give you a blank money order or a blank uh, cashier's check, it is cash. It is the same as cash. And I think money orders don't have to have the name on them. Cashier's checks do. Um, if they gave you a blank one, it's, it's the same as cash. Anybody who gets it can write their name on the front, endorse the back, and cash it. Uh, if it's got a pre-printed name on the front, once it's endorsed by the person whose name is on the front, it's the same as cash. Anyway, <laughs> that was a digression. Uh, but yes, post-dated check. Uh, a person may want to contribute, but can't do so until a future date. 
have him to sign one of the cards and state the amount and time he wishes to contribute. It will be counted as cash. Herewith is a list of the solicitors. In some cases, it may be wise to contact the person working on the next street in order not to duplicate solicitation in border homes. The drive for funds is from Tuesday, October 27 through Friday, November 6. Please make an effort to see everyone on your list in that time. So this was likely the origin of no soliciting signs. Uh, well, part of the origin of no soliciting signs. Like, they had a list of solicitors who were going to go knock people up, uh, as the British would say, uh, going to go knock on people's doors. Uh, because knocking someone up has a different meaning in the United States. Um, gonna go knock on people's doors and uh, ask them to contribute to the community chest fund. <laughs> oh yeah, store cards. Those were a thing. I think those are still a thing. But now today, most store cards are Visa or MasterCard. Uh, but yeah, back in like the 70s, 80s, possibly, probably earlier, store credit accounts uh, weren't necessarily tied to any of the major credit card companies. Um, the, uh, if a person does not contribute, please list it as such. We're going to keep a record. If you don't give to the community chest, we will know. If for some reason you cannot contact everyone on your list, please indicate it after their name. Please turn in your list and solicited contributions to Mr. Mason Hevener at the Blacksburg Hardware. He is treasurer of the Community Federation. May I take this opportunity to thank you personally for assisting in this worthy cause. I trust you will find the work interesting and pleasurable. <laughs> oh, wow. And, and we have the list of solicitors. So, <laughs> I'm glad it made you laugh, Crafty Becky. Um, we have the list of solicitors, which is less interesting for who the solicitors were, because they're just names of people from the community. And in most cases, we just have uh, initials and last names, so we don't necessarily know specifically who they are, and most people aren't going to care. But these are the places that they were going to do solicitation for the Community Chest Fund. And the first section is College Buildings. <clears throat> uh, so this was, they were going to Virginia Tech's campus to solicit for donations to the Community Chest Fund. Uh, we had the infirmary, the first academic building, the second academic building. These were literal building names uh, before they started actually putting people's names on buildings. Um, and, and even today, like, buildings are like, new residence hall for decades before, until they get a high enough uh, donation to warrant putting somebody's name on a building. And that's the same at every university, basically. Plumbing, Mechanical Lab and Powerhouse, McBride, uh, Teaching and Administration, Old Agricultural Hall, Dairy Husbandry, Vocational Education, Home Economics, Agricultural Engineering, Natural Sciences, New Agricultural Hall, uh, Student Activities Building, uh, which is Squires Hall today. Um, and sat in the same place where Squires Hall is today, if anybody's familiar with Virginia Tech's campus, but was a different building. Uh, Commerce Hall, Military, Utilities, Mineral Industrial, er, uh, mil Mineral Industry, I think is the building name, I'm not sure. Um, Aeronautics and Patent, Patent Hall, Davidson Hall, Extension, uh, AAA, Old Ag Hall, War Memorial Hall, The Library, and Dining Hall. At the public schools, they had a solicitor for the grammar school and the high school. 
I assumed they were going in not to solicit from students, but to solicit from the like faculty and staff. <laughs> oh dear. Let's see. Uh, no cards for us, just a database with owed amount. Business owners and sometimes private people had credit. Gotcha. And, and Obi-Wan Pez, knocking people up will be a pleasurable, pleasurable business. Oh dear. Obi-Wan. <laughs> uh, possibly, depending on which meaning of the term you mean, whether you mean the American one or the British one. Um, business firms, uh, they sent people to the Blacksburg Motor Company, to Farmers and Merchants Bank, uh, which Farmers and Merchants Bank is FNM Bank, and they're still in operation today. Uh, Roses, five and ten cent store. Uh, oh, so this is, they have a, just basically a section of um, the business district. So Mrs. H.L. Dunton was to uh, solicit from the Blacksburg Motor Company through Farmers and Merchants Bank. And Mrs. L.B. Connolly was to go from Roses five and ten cent store through the Western Union. Uh, and Mrs. G.W. Litton went from the A&P to underselling store. I do not know what the underselling store was, but now I'm very curious about what the underselling store was. I know what the A&P is. I don't know what A&P stands for, but I know what an A&P is. What is an underselling store? Uh, Mrs. F.E. Willard went from Kroger's store which is Kroger today, the grocery store chain, uh, and Brown's Hardware. And Mrs. L.B. Dietrich went from New River Lumber Company to the Town Hall. A store that sells stuff cheaper than others? I don't know. I wonder if it's like similar to a dollar store. Um, I have to, I'm just gonna see if any result comes up. Uh, I think I'm gonna put quotation marks on that. I just wanna see the picture, please. I just want to see the picture. I found an eBay listing for an item from 1948 for a place called the Underselling Store. It has a photo. Dry goods, shoes, clothing, and ready to wear. All right, so basically just like a department store. <clears throat> Grand Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company. That's what the A&P stood for. I knew it was a grocer's. I didn't know what A&P stood for. That's really interesting. Didn't realize Kroger was that old or had been in this area so long. They were founded in 1883. Yeah, Kroger is, is very old, but they're also a huge, huge company that has been around forever. And um, yeah, they're, they're, I'm not surprised to see Kroger's listed here. But yeah, thank you for finding a date on that. Um, To, I have to remember that Jacob is over here in the other chat. I'm happy I have people chatting in both channels today. Uh, <laughs> homes. Homes of those not solicited, solicited as employed of the college, public school, or business firms. So this is, this is a time 
When the population was small enough, and they had records good enough to know that if they had solicited somebody at their place of business, they were not going to go and knock on their door at home. There are ways to do that, but it's a massive undertaking because basically the people who've done the solicitation at the businesses, they will have spoken to people and the people who offered to give donations, they would have recorded what their home address was. So then they have a list of donations associated with home addresses and then they have to generate the list of homes to be visited, but they also have to generate a list of these are all of the homes that have already contributed, so don't knock on their doors. That's a lot of paperwork. That's a huge administrative effort. Uh, so they had someone who went from south of 1000 South Main Street, Warreners? I don't know what that is, to north of one, uh, or uh, then they had somebody who did north of 1000 South Main Street to second stoplight, north of the second stoplight on Main Street to the north end of town. Someone who did Draper Road, someone who did Clay Street and Washington, someone who did Roanoke Street, someone who did Wilson Street and Harding Avenue, uh, someone who did Old Newport Road, someone did Preston Avenue, Cup Street, Lee Street, Progress Street, and Price's Fork Road. And my gosh, that listing of places makes Blacksburg seem very, very small. And in fact, in 1942, probably was. You would need a lot more street listings than this today. <laughs> I just, I find all of this really fascinating. Like, I first came across this stuff before I really knew much about Blacksburg geographically or historically or any of that. Um, and I still found it really fascinating. Uh, because it's all about this community chest idea, this mutual aid organization. This was a community organization who came together to help out the rest of the community. Now, I will say, this was the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. So when they're talking about helping the rest of the community, they are 100% talking about helping the other white people in town. None of this was for the black population. And I do not have records as to whether they ran their own community chest. We do have materials from, um, uh, oh, my brain is, is not giving me the name of the organization. Um, oh dear. Uh, I've got it. Uh, uh, there was a, um, a lodge here for the International Order of Odd Fellows, as well as, uh, um, I think it's Daughters of Ruth, which was the women's organization associated with the, order, the Odd Fellows. Um, so there were community organizations here for the black community. Uh, and it's possible that they would have run similar fundraising efforts, similar mutual aid stuff. Unfortunately, we don't really have records from the 1930s from Oddfellows Hall. Uh, so I don't know if they were operating, running their own community chests or not. But when this is talking about supporting the community, it is 100% talking about the white community. So I find it really fascinating, and they did great work, but it was specifically for the white community. Something for your money. Recreation year-round for school children. Oh, Galara, I, I mean, yikes, yes, but also completely unsurprising. Uh, this was the first half of the 20th century. Nothing was multiracial. 
This was before the civil rights movement in the 60s. Nothing was integrated. So community support organizations to help people get through the Great Depression would not have been integrated. Um, let's see. So this is telling you what you'll get during the fundraising drive. Uh, recreation year-round for school children. Medical and dental corrections provided 125 school children. There are just two. These are just two of the dividends paid on your last year's investment in the Blacksburg Community Federation. Was it worth it? Miss Kate Bolton, County Welfare Director, commends the Federation for the closer cooperation and the better understanding that went into casework services, the most helpful in the history of the Federation. Dr. Fred Heath, County Health Director, says, Federation deserves much credit for making dental service available to 100 children. It has provided motor core facilities for transportation of children to clinics and hospitals for corrections of physical defects. Financial contributions were made to mental hygiene service and to Montgomery County Eye Clinic. Mental hygiene service. I must look this up. I just... Why does Google suggest mental hygiene legal service? It's an interesting phrase. I'm assuming that this is... Um, essentially mental health, but I would be curious to know specifically what fell under the umbrella of mental hygiene service in the early 1940s. Uh, are they talking about what would have been termed hysteria, uh, which is women who are too uppity? Are they talking about um, war trauma, like that type of thing? Because this is, uh, this one would have been after 1945. So this would have been post-World War II era. Uh, so are they talking about post-war trauma victims and, and the mental stuff there? Uh, I'm, I'm curious as to what was covered under mental hygiene service. Um, I didn't find anything with a quick search, and that would be something where I would need to do some more extensive searching to see if I could discover that if I was wanting to do some research on this and wanted to go in depth on the types of services they provided, I would need to figure out exactly what that phrase meant in 1946-ish. A total of $4,000 for these and other essential activities in the Blacksburg Magisterial District for, uh, for next year will be sought in Community Chest Drive October 11 through 22. I have never in my life heard anything in the U.S. referred to as a Magisterial District until today. Uh... That is just not a phrase that is in common usage in the United States. But that would be like the, everything within Blacksburg's jurisdiction um, would be the, the Blacksburg Magisterial District. <laughs> we don't really have magistrates here in the, in the United States. So seeing a magisterial district as a phrase is just weird. I've pushed it up too far now. Okay, let's let's bump it back down just a tad here. Yeah, come on, let's go. No, no, seriously, I, I, I want to bring it down. There we go. Here's where your money will go. Health, $1,100 for medical and dental services for children in Blacksburg District whose parents are unable to give attention to the needed correction. 
So already, uh, if you remember, 1934, they were looking to raise 1,600 total. And here, just for the first item, 1,100. I, I'm really concerned with the language here about how they keep referring to things as uh, the needed corrections, uh, which implies to me that um, they were looking to correct physical disabilities, which I'm concerned about what that meant in 1942. I don't know. That language just leads me in... in uh, scary 1940s nurse horror movie directions. That's all. Um, I'd be very curious to dig into exactly what kinds of services were, um, were being provided through the health, uh, the health fund of the community chest. That would be an interesting research topic. Uh, recreation, 1500 for equipment, activities, part-time assistance for the year-round program in Blacksburg District. Uh, Social welfare, $250 for emergency welfare cases and welfare educational work. Education, $300 for books and for promotion of educational projects in the 13 schools of district. Civic, $100 for coordinated activity of organizations for betterment of community. Um, it's just, it, it's not a lovely phrase. Yeah, Obi-Wan. It's, it's, even if they just mean, like, getting people necessary medical treatment. Talking about it as corrections, it just sounds iffy. Uh, town and country relations. $250 for promotion of joint town and rural activities. Cancer Foundation. $100 for cancer care and research. Children's Home Society. $50 for placement of homeless children. Girl Scouts, $50 for training of leaders. I note that we no longer have money going to the Boy Scouts. That's fascinating. They budget money for the Girl Scouts on here and not the Boy Scouts, and that is amazing to me. Uh, possibly Crooked Teeth? I mean, under this budget, health, um, in 34, they were much more specific. They broke out health as a separate category from uh, dental and eye. Uh, and so necessary corrections here might be in the context of like vision and getting people glasses and dental and getting people braces. And in those cases, corrections, I suppose, would be an appropriate term. But when it's under the broad umbrella of health, it made me wonder. Uh, high school band, $100 for instruments. School telephones, $100 for keeping phones in Blacksburg schools. And miscellaneous, $100 for operating expenses, supplies, etc. A campaign worker will call on you next week. Be as generous as you can. And this was definitely a flyer. You can see it's kind of crumbling at the edges. It's um, not the most sturdy of paper. It's had some... Um, I'll show the back. You can see it, uh, the difference in color, the like sort of brownish orange on the edges and then the pink color. This was a pink flyer. It has been exposed to sunlight on its edges. So it sat in a stack somewhere where this part was covered by something else and this part was exposed to sun. And this is sun damage that has dried out and browned this um, colored paper over time uh, and you can see the paper is in much better condition here where it was protected from the sun but all of the edges have sun damage. Leg braces for, yeah, that, that type of thing too and yeah, polio um, interventions would have would have definitely been uh, the right time frame for that. So I just, I, uh, a number of the things, like this one doesn't have as much of the discoloration, but it also has the same sun damage on the edges. Um, but 
I just looked at the clock. <laughs> and you know what? We've reached the end of our time for today. <laughs> so I hope that you had uh, an interesting time. I hope that you had fun um, exploring with me some documents from the Blacksburg Community Federation. This collection is only nine folders, and they're not particularly thick folders, but we really found items of interest and uh, had interesting conversations um, really in just three out of the nine folders. Uh, so there's plenty more that could be found in a collection like this. Um, if you're at all interested in exploring things in your local history, you probably have an archives near you that collects local history materials. Um, we are one of a few archives in this area that collect local history stuff. Um, and if you're at all interested in just exploring more history stuff and you are comfortable going out into the world, I encourage you to visit a local archives and take a look at things there. But if you're not ready to do that and you want to explore archives with me again next week, um, you should come on by. We'll be looking at this box next week. It looks much the same. This is the Joshua Gilman Hawks Papers. I know very little. I know this is, we have this because it is associated with the American Civil War. Uh, and I was just randomly typing numbers in. I literally just, at random, in the search box typed MS 1979-003 because that's how our collection numbers are formulated and I wanted to bring up one at random. So I typed in a number. This is the one that came up. And what struck me about it was a note in here at the end of the biographical note for Joshua Gilman Hawks. It says, um, <clears throat> was expected after his recovery to accept an officer's commission in United States Colored Troops Regiment which if you're aware of the Civil War era and uh, the United States Army of the time, there was what was called the Colored Troops Unit or Regiment um, that was primarily people of color, primarily black people, but also Asian people and anybody who would have been considered of color at the time would have been in that unit. Now their officers likely would have been white, but uh, that caught my eye. I've never looked at it before. Uh, it seemed like something that might be interesting to look at on stream, so that's what we're gonna look at next week. Uh, so hopefully uh, some of you will come back and join me then. Uh, let me go ahead and set up a raid uh, to end our stream today, I believe. Uh, Mom. Ray. I believe they have the otter cam up today at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. So I think that's where we're gonna go. Uh, as, if, as if there was any question, we always go and raid the Monterey Bay Aquarium. They have a nice chill stream. Uh, it's good background if you just need some sound in the background, um, but also just wholesome content. And if it is indeed the otter cam today, the otter cam is super cute. Uh, so, um, I want to thank everybody for joining me today. I really, uh, really, really enjoy this part of my job. Um, and I enjoy having you all come and join me for a couple of hours on Wednesday to look at another collection from our collections and see what we have in the archives. And honestly, if I continue doing this for the rest of my life, we will never finish. We will never run out of things to look at. Uh, I, I, I firmly believe two hours once a week, we will never run out. Um, I'm also vamping for time because I can't, my, my little switcher um, t it logged me out right when I was getting ready to switch to stream ending. Anyway, thank you all for coming. It was great having you here today. I hope I see you again next week for the next Archival Adventures at 2.30 p.m. Eastern on twitch.tv slash vtulstudios or twitch.tv slash rogan27. Um, 
And yeah, I look forward to seeing you again soon. Until then, bye. <laughs>